So we've already looked at the history of Earth from when it formed to about the year 2 billion, which is when we saw the evolution of photosynthesis. But at that time, we were still looking at just prokaryotes. And so what we're going to do in this lecture is continue on in our evolutionary history and specifically, <clears throat> excuse me, focus on the rise of eukaryotes. So the rise of eukaryotes happened about half a billion years after the onset of photosynthesis. Now to give you an idea, remember Earth is about 4.5 billion years old. So it's not until the year 2.5 billion, so over half of Earth's lifespan, that we start seeing the evolution of eukaryotes. Now remember, eukarya is the name of the domain. Remember the other domains are bacteria and archaea. So eukarya includes all of the eukaryotes. And while there's many differences between eukaryotes and prokaryotes, the two features that we're going to focus on is having a nucleus and specifically having a nuclear envelope, uh, essentially a holding cell, if you will, for the genetic material, and then membrane bound organelles. Again, keep in mind that prokaryotes do have DNA. Prokaryotes also have the framework to be able to do a lot of cellular processes. It's just in you in prokaryotes, those processes and that DNA is not housed in any kind of membrane, whereas in eukaryotes they are. And so what we're going to explore is kind of how that happened. How did we get the evolution of eukaryotes? So we're going to focus on two different things. We're going to focus on the membrane bound organelles, and then we're going to focus on the actual acquiring of some of those organelles. Some of these processes existed in prokaryotes, and then it was just the organelles or the membranes that needed to form around them. So two things in particular, the nucleus and the endoplasmic reticulum are surrounded by a plasma membrane in present day eukaryotes and in prokaryotes that's lacking. Scientists hypothesize that the way that those organelles or those areas of the cell became covered in plasma membrane is through infoldings of the cellular membrane. This could have been on accident, so something in the environment may have caused an infolding. It could have been a mutation that caused random divots um, in the plasma membrane. It could have been a lot of things. It's hard to mimic this in the lab because of the amount of time this took and the randomness that it happened in. But scientists think that if you look at this plasma membrane here on the right hand side, you can see it's folding in. And as it's folding in, it's surrounding the nucleus it's a surround, or it's surrounding the protein synthesis or fat synthesis in our endoplasmic reticulum. Some evidence of this is that if you look at the structure of these membranes that are around the nucleus in ER, it's actually very similar to the exterior plasma membrane, which is why we think it may have happened. Now something that I want you to consider that we'll explore more in class is why was this selected for? So let's say it is a mutation, say it was a random happenstance. Why did it continue? Why did we see further development of this versus just the death of those prokaryotes? That might have been a downside to them. So what upside existed in order to have these guys survive? And again, we're going to explore that more in class, but start pondering that now. So this is one thing that we saw develop in our rise of eukaryotes. The other thing that we saw is this idea of endosymbiosis. Endo means within, and symbiosis means a relationship between organisms. And what this describes, I'm going to put everything at once and then I'm going to describe it. What this describes is how eukaryotic cells got two specific organelles, the mitochondria and the chloroplast. Scientists do not believe that these were in were covered by infoldings of the membrane. They believe that these two organelles, the chloroplast and the mitochondria, were actually acquired. They, they did not come from within the cell, but actually outside of the cell. So here's how scientists think that these two organelles came to be. So on the left hand side, it says ancestral prokaryote. It's showing, okay, this was what it originally was like. The second image you've already seen, where scientists hypothesize that there is an infolding of the plasma membrane that, that folded in and surrounded the nuclear material, creating what we call the nucleus. And it also surrounded where protein and fat synthesis was happening, or the endoplasmic reticulum. But that's not all the cell is, right? The cell, if it's a plant cell, has 
uh, chloroplasm mitochondria, if it's an animal or fungal cell, it has, has mitochondria, but not chloroplasts. So what we think happened is this ancestral prokaryote went to consume something. Went to, it shows it both at once, but it hap probably was one and then the next one. So we'll just start with the aerobic bacterium. So we think this ancestral prokaryote engulfed it. And this is typical. This is how prokaryotes eat. They engulf materials, they surround a material, and then they use different proteins and different enzymes within the cell in order to break down whatever it is they absorbed and get the nutrients, the amino acids, the fats to get everything that they need from it and then expel the waste. So this is typical. This prokaryote engulfing something to eat, pretty typical. Now, what scientists think is they engulfed an aerobic bacterium. So a bacteria that was able to use oxygen to break down um, sugars and create energy. And so this ancestral prokaryote engulfed this bacterium with the intention of consuming it, but it didn't. Now, why didn't it? could have been some sort of defect, so perhaps it didn't have the enzymes uh, or the proteins to break it down. Or perhaps it was because it was able to sense something positive coming from it. This aerobic bacterium is similar to these present-day mitochondria, which means that this mitochondria, um, as it's undergoing cellular respiration, is creating ATP. Well, this ancestral prokaryote may have Instead of using proteins, it was detecting the, the fact that there's ATP that was highly present. It was detecting that it was, or it was able to somehow use that ATP. And so instead of consuming it, it kind of just stayed in there because that ancestral prokaryote was actually getting more benefits with it being alive versus directly engulfing it. Now, which happened? Was it, oh, they couldn't eat it or they decided not to eat it? We have no idea right? This event happened billions of years ago. We haven't been able to recreate it in the lab, and we probably never will be able to recreate it in the lab. Similar thing happened. That ancestral prokaryote engulfed a cyanobacteria. We learned earlier that cyanobacteria can do photosynthesis. So this ancestral prokaryote may have gone to eaten that cyanobacteria and engulfed it and took it into the cell, but we don't know how. Why didn't it consume it? Was it a defect of the ancestral prokaryote? Was the ancestral prokaryote able to tell or able to sense or able to like um, read the hormones or, or was it getting direct, those direct benefits right away? We don't know. But for whatever reason, it did not break down that bacteria that it was engulfing. Well, that bacteria became what are present day chloroplasts. Right? It's the photosynthesis hub in plant cells. It's able to produce that glucose, produce that fixed carbon compound that can then later used to generate energy for the cell. So again, we're not gonna be able to tell this um, offhand if, if this is what really happened, um, but, it, but it's a start, it's an idea. Now, what evidence do we have? As I mentioned before, we really can't stimulate this in the lab, at least not yet, and potentially ever. So let's talk about how we think this is why it happened. The first piece of evidence, I'll tell you right off the bat, is not a strong piece of evidence, but a piece of evidence nonetheless. So the organelles, the chloroplasts and the mitochondria, are about the size of a prokaryote. Remember, prokaryotes much smaller than eukaryotes. Again, not a strong piece of evidence, but a piece of evidence nonetheless. Now here's something kind of unique. Both chloroplasts and mitochondria have their own ribosomes and their own DNA that are different from the cell that they're found in. The mitochondrial DNA is actually a really interesting field of research. We're not gonna talk much about it, but just know that it's a different set of DNA and ribosomes. Well, if these originated from within the cell, why would they have a separate thing of ribosomes? Why would they, and how would they have a separate thing of DNA? It makes a lot more sense to be like, oh, this is probably ancestral DNA. This is probably ancestral ribosomes from, the, uh, from an organism that was outside of the cell. That's a lot easier to explain why there's different DNA than just saying, yeah, they were within the same cell and somehow took part of the DNA and then started changing that DNA. That's a lot harder. Um, to explain or to support, then it just came from outside the cell. 
Another line of evidence is that if you look at all of the organelles that are within a eukaryotic cell, they have a single plasma membrane. The nucleus, single plasma membrane. Golgi apparatus, the ERs, the peroxisomes, all of those organelles have a single plasma membrane. However, both chloroplasts and mitochondria have two membranes. They have an outer membrane and an inner membrane. And we think that this is evidence of how they uh, were originally engulfed. So take a look at this third image. Uh, and we'll use the chloroplast. I think the chloroplast is a little bit easier to visualize. So here's that original cyanobacteria with a single, uh, sorry, with a single plasma membrane. And then it gets engulfed. And what happens in engulfing when, it, when we're talking about cells is that plasma membrane starts pit, uh, pinching in and starts wrapping itself around whatever it's engulfing until it's 100% wrapped with that membrane. And then the cell is going to insert uh, different proteins and different molecules in order to start breaking it down. So what scientists think is that the inner membrane that we see in chloroplasts is actually the membrane of the original cyanobacteria. And the outer membrane is the membrane that it was acquired when it was engulfed. We see both double membranes in chloroplasts and in mitochondria. Again, not a super strong piece of evidence, but it is something that is unique to these two organelles that we don't see anywhere else in our cells. And then finally, and what I think is probably the most important or strongest piece of evidence, is the way they reproduce or the way they replicate. You've probably learned a lot about mitosis, and when we talk about mitosis, we always talk about DNA. Here's what the DNA does. Here's how the DNA splits. Here's what DNA is doing. Anaphase is about DNA pulling apart, etc. Cool. That's about DNA. And we never really talk about what happens to the organelles. So what happens with the organelles is once that DNA splits and we have our two new cells, that the DNA actually has the codes on how to make the organelle. So a new endoplasmic reticulum gets made, a new Golgi apparatus gets made. But our DNA lacks the instructions to make a chloroplast. Our DNA doesn't know how to make mitochondria. Instead, what happens is while the DNA, or sorry, while the cell is undergoing mitosis, different hormones or chemical signals are being sent. And the mitochondria and the chloroplast know those signals. And when it senses those signals or receives those signals, it signals for them to start replicating themselves. And they replicate through fission, which is kind of like an asexual reproduction where they start splitting. So mitochondria gets the signal like, hey guys, we're going to be reproducing here soon. And the mitochondria on their own reproduce. They duplicate themselves. Remember, they've got their own set of DNA. They've got their own set of ribosomes. So they create copies of themselves. Chloroplasts make copies of themselves. And then those extra copies are getting split up into the two dividing cells. So the fact that our cells have no idea how to make these organelles and those organelles can reproduce on their own, this is telling us something. Like, I, how, well, it doesn't make sense that this, our DNA can't, doesn't, has no idea how to make them it makes a lot more sense to be like, okay, these were outsider organelles. These were organelles that our original cells acquired billions of years ago, but they're still little, little pieces of, of history stuck with them. And I think that's kind of fascinating that we still see the remnants of their ancestral past, past even though they're doing such um, integrated work within our cells now. So again, this is happening in year 2.5 billion, or you can think of this as 2 billion years ago. We see the evolution of prokaryotes a couple different ways. We see the evolution of a nuclear membrane and the endoplasmic reticulum membrane through infoldings of the outer plasma membrane. I do want to make it clear that is not endosymbiosis. That is just explaining those nuclear envelopes. Endosymbiosis is specifically referring to the engulfing of mitochondria and chloroplasts into present day, or sorry, the engulfing of cyanobacteria and aerobic bacteria into the present day chloroplasts and mitochondria. We have a lot of evidence for it. We will probably never be able to prove it uh, or strongly support it, 
because it's really hard to do this in a lab, but good evidence nonetheless uh, of the relationship between those ancient prokaryotes to present-day eukaryotes.